Hey guys, we're in the second week of our series called Exclusive Drop. And so let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever followed someone on social media only to find out that they are different than you expected them to be in real life? You and I know that you can hardly tell every, everything about someone based on outward appearances. And it's possible that maybe, just maybe, it's the people that we underestimate most who can add the most value to our lives. And if you've ever wondered how to tell who someone really is, then stick around because we're going to talk about it. And so check out this video to help me explain what I mean. A while ago, there was a trend going around where hyper-realistic looking items were actually made of cake. The point is, on the outside, it may look like one thing, but on the inside, it's cake. But that's what makes them so intriguing. Your eyes tell you one thing, but the reality is totally different. So on the outside, your eyes tell you one thing, but in reality, it's totally different. And we can do this with food, sure, but the truth is we use what we see to draw conclusions about all sorts of different things. But maybe more than anything else, we do this with people. In fact, studies show it takes us just seven seconds to make a first impression. And you could be sure that's a large part of what first impression is based on how someone looks. And it makes sense why we do this. Our brains like categories, we like labels, and the faster we can put someone in a category or a group, the less work our brains have to do. And let's just be honest, our brains are like us. They want to do the least amount of work possible. So slapping a label on someone as soon as we can is more than just convenient. It saves us energy. And this is the way that people have always worked. And in, in, in fact, there is a story in the Old Testament of the Bible that talks about this very thing. A guy named Samuel was a prophet for God, which means that God would speak to him and then Samuel would communicate God's message to God's people. And at this point in time, the Hebrew people had just become their own sort of kingdom and God wanted to be their king. And there was only one problem. The Hebrew people didn't want to look strange to the surrounding kingdoms, and they wanted a human flesh and blood king like all the other kingdoms had. So a guy named Saul became their king, and Saul was great for a while, but it didn't take long before the being king started to go to, and get to his head. He quit representing God and leading the way that God wanted, so God told Samuel that there would be a new king and that Samuel was going to find him. And the only problem was God had not been very specific about who this new king would be, only what family he would come from. So Samuel heads to that family, Jesse's family, to find the next king of Israel. And here's what happened in 1 Samuel 16.5. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed one. In other words, Jesse's son Eliab looked like he could be the king. And this son had to be the one God wanted. But the author of Samuel says in 1 Samuel 16, verse seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The story goes on and one by one, Jesse brings out his sons, all assuming that they had to be the next king of Israel. And over and over again, God tells Samuel, nope, not this one either. And the story sums up what all of us have experienced at one point or another. What we see makes us draw a conclusion that ends up being totally wrong. And we size someone up or someone sizes us up and we make assumptions that are way off all because of what we see or don't see. And Samuel did it and Jesse did it. They missed what God could see. The problem is, is you and I do this all the time. We make comparisons and we size others up and we think that what we see or what we believe is the standard and it has to be right. But the truth is God's judgment, God's standard is the only one that matters and God doesn't make quick assumptions about people. So when we look at ourselves and we look at someone else, we might see a world of difference, but what does God see? God's image in us and God's image in them. Which leads us to an even bigger question. Let me explain. We might deny that we judge or look down on someone, but there's one test that reveals how we really see someone. Can you gas up someone that you don't get along with? 
Like, can you in all sincerity find something to hype up and celebrate about someone you consider really different than you? Can you see the image of God in those who you don't like, those who annoy you? What about people who you feel like are less privileged? People who are more materially poor, people with different physical or cognitive ability or capability. How do you see the image of God in them? Even more, when you see someone who has it easier than you, who you think of as less oppressed or as having a more privileged life, does that make you angry or resentful towards them? Do you believe the image of God is there in the people that you dislike? And that's where things get a little more complicated, right? It's hard to accept that someone who devalues others has value themselves. So how do you handle knowing that everyone is made in the image of God and, and it includes those who have done incredible harm to others, who have made you angry or who have even just annoyed you? God sees the bigger picture and you are invited to see others the way that God sees them. And the thing is that we can make a judgment about someone and, and be way off. But we can also make a judgment about someone and totally nail it. That person or that group is, has gotten it wrong and, and has done something they shouldn't and has rightfully earned the label that they have. But then even then, God sees something in them that we can't always see. What does God see? God sees that person as a beautiful creation and a person who was gifted, who was gifted the image of God. And let's be honest, that can be hard for us to accept. And there's a passage from the book of Psalms, a book that is considered a kind of poetry or even songs that is found in what we call the Old Testament that talks about this idea. And this Psalm was written by King David, the son of Jesse, that was chosen to be king after Saul. And he writes this in Psalm 139, 13 through 18. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in the utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grain of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. And it may be tempting to read that and relate to what David is saying because the same is true for us. God made us, God is with us. We are God's complex workmanship and God sees us as precious and valuable. But here's the thing, those aren't just truths David wrote about himself to make us feel good about ourselves. Those things are true for everyone. Even the people we might not want it to be true about. God is with a person that we don't like. God created your not so favorite teacher. God sees your annoying little stepbrother as precious. And in other words, knowing you're valuable to God is never meant to make other people less valuable to you. All people were created on purpose and for a purpose. And that means God's image is in each and every person that we meet. God is deeply involved in part of every person's life. We might look at someone and see a bad decision maker, an annoyance, a frustrating personality, but God sees someone made in his image. Everyone is someone made uniquely in God's image. So what do we do with this? How do we begin to see others like there may be more to them than we might first see? How do we begin to see others like they are made in the image of God? When it comes to our individual lives, we start where Jesus started, with love. Jesus tells us to love our neighbor. And these, and these days, our neighbor can mean an actual neighbor next door or our global neighbor. We are so much more connected now than the world has ever been before, which makes seeing the image of God in others, no matter where they are in the world, easier to do. Not only is loving our neighbor something Jesus asks us to do, it's something Jesus knew would not only be good for our neighbor, but good for us. When we withhold love or withhold acknowledging God's image in someone else, we end up missing out on how big God really is. It shrinks our view of God and limits our human experience. 
So here are a couple ways that we can do this well. Number one, get to know your close by neighbors. This could be your literal neighbors. This could be your desk neighbors in class or even your school neighbor that you haven't talked too much. Start with their names, then strike up a conversation and get to know their families, their interests, their, their life experiences. Maybe you can start praying for them by name or even ask them good questions to learn more about their lives. See if they have any needs that you can help meet. Be really brave and open yourself up to having them meet your needs too. And number two, get to know your distant neighbors. Get to know their stories, celebrate their culture, seek, their, seek to understand their values. Find ways to learn from them so that you can see how they uniquely reflect God's image. Then figure out the needs of your distant neighbors and find real tangible ways to meet them. And here's the challenge. Think outside the box. Think geographically as well as generationally. Think socially as well as financially. Even more, the group identity that we are invited to as a church is more unique than anything else that we can ever get to ch get the chance to be a part of. Why? Because from the very beginning, Jesus established the church to be the most diverse community of people coexisting together, surrounded by and held together by God's unconditional love. And so when we work together as a church, we show the entire world how big God's love is for all creation. And we get to participate in the work that Jesus started here on this earth. Everyone is someone made uniquely in God's image. And that is great news, and it can shape so much of how we approach life. Living like that is true means looking to see God in each and every person that you encounter, no matter how different they might be from you, and how they look, and how they behave, and how they believe. If you're really looking, you can see God's image in them too. And as difficult as it might be to believe that is true, imagine living as if it were true. Imagine what would happen if our community, in our community, if we started to see God in each and every person. We would be able to show others what a life following Jesus could look like. We could be a living example of the kindness, love, and patience that God offers everyone. Not only is that unexpected, it's what makes us unique as followers of Jesus. So let me pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your goodness to us. And God, I just pray that we can learn to love people that are hard to love. I pray that we can see people as image bearers of God, just like we are. And so that we can make a difference in the world around us because of the way that we treat and love other people. And God, I pray that that starts here in Roots, that we can start to know people uh, that are different than us and start to learn to love them even when they aren't the same type of personality that we normally hang out with. Help us love people well, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks for watching, guys. We will see you guys next week. We are starting a new series next week and it's going to be a party, all right? We'll see you guys later. Bye.